from a lightweight aggregate manufacturer or supplier's perspective, what is our responsibility in this process? So, expanded shale clay and slate. This is a composite sample of all the uh, expanded shales, clays, and slates produced in North America. There's an equal weight of material in each one of these cylinders. The other four cylinders are normal weight materials, what they call normal weight materials, I call them ordinary materials. And the center cylinder is the composite sample of lightweight aggregate. You can see that you get more than twice the volume for the given amount of weight of aggregate. And there's, if you look close on the table, it doesn't even hold all of the, the aggregate particles that it takes because that's how, I mean that's what we sell, we sell light. We produce it to comply with uh, ASTM C330 and C331 and the newest specification C1761 which is the lightweight, the, the specification for lightweight aggregates for internal curing of concrete. I thought it might be worthwhile to, to show you a little flow chart of how we produce our material. We mine the raw material and depending on the raw material it varies from plant to plant but uh, some amount of processing might need to be done before it gets put into a rotary kiln but it eventually it gets fed into the upper end of a rotary kiln, the same kind of kiln they make Portland cement in. In fact, probably most of the lightweight plants are using kilns that were originally in a cement plant. That's, that's what the material looks like during the process at about 2,000 degrees. It varies a little bit from plant to plant, comes out. It's no longer clay or shale or slate. It is a ceramic lightweight aggregate. Uh, of a variety of sizes coming out of the kiln. It gets stockpiled and it gets shipped. It might be shipped out of a silo, it might be shipped out of a stockpile, depending on the plant. We ship cars, rail cars and trucks. And we produce in different sizes for different applications. We produce coarse aggregate for structural lightweight concrete, finer aggregate for concrete masonry units, even finer aggregate for uh, things like uh, wallboard. Point is we produce different sizes. The fine aggregate typically is used in internal curing for the reasons that Jason mentioned, and this is kind of a graphical depiction of that, if you used coarse aggregate, you'd have to use a lot more of it to get the particles close enough together to get the influence on the cement paste that you want. With fine aggregate, it's naturally distributed throughout the, uh, the matrix, so you get it. So our role is to assist ready mix producers. Basically, the, the easiest way to do mix designs is to like for Denver Water, they started with a good mix design without internal curing and we convert that mix design to an internal curing mix design. We, we look at the cementitious materials content, we look at the aggregate properties, and we figure out how much sand to take out and how much uh, lightweight to, to replace it with. We're, repl <coughs> we're taking out sand and replacing it with an equal volume of lightweight sand. If you use coarse aggregate for internal curing, you're going to end up doing lightweight concrete, essentially, because you have to replace enough of the, of the uh, coarse aggregate to get that kind of internal curing water in it. And that's why we don't have a lot of problems with shrinkage cracking in lightweight concrete, because you're getting that internal curing benefit when you do lightweight concrete, and always have. We just didn't know it for a long time until somebody like Jason started doing research. We know the, the properties of our materials, so we're able to, to help with that kind of stuff and train personnel on how to, how to handle the material and how to make the concrete. But basically, bottom line is our job is to help things go smoothly. It's to take away the, the mystery of it because we're not doing anything other than making concrete. It's, it's still concrete. There's nothing magic about it, as Jason said. This picture's here just to give you an idea of, of the effect of the internal curing. These cylinders were at the Florida DOT lab, made at the same time, the cylinder molds were stripped at the same time, and the, the lab technician was just taken by the difference in the appearance of the internally cured cylinders compared to the, the conventional cylinders, and it, and it shows that that internal moisture is staying in there. We talked about wet curing and specifications. Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development has a standard specification that says all bridge decks need to be wet cured for 10 days. That bridge was done in northern Louisiana in a remote area, evidently no access to running water. They had burlap on the site, no burlap was applied. That, that deck was internally cured. It, this bridge was being used as a demonstration project to basically for one, one side of the DOTD to sell 
the bridge section on using internal curing in their bridge specs. So they've got a wet, curing, a wet cure specification. They got burlap on the site. They got no water. They're pouring. They poured this deck uh, beginning about one in the morning because it was a in July. It was a hundred and something degrees in the afternoons. It was really brutally hot. So they poured it at night to avoid having to do it in the heat of the day. That picture was taken at eight o'clock the next morning. They sprayed curing compound on the deck as they were finishing it, and. When, evidently when they got done they ran out of curing compound so you have a deck that this was the second internally cured span that they placed the first one used 300 pounds of pre-soaked lightweight fine aggregate instead of an equal volume of sand this one the second one used half that amount they used hundred it used 150 after we were all said and done, we had all the numbers, we back calculated to find out how many pounds of internal curing water per 100 pounds of cement that deck got. It got 4.7, which is less than the magic seven pounds number. They surveyed that deck a year after it was placed. They could find with the, with the naked eye, no shrinkage cracking occurring on that deck, even in the end that got no curing compound. Needless to say, that resulted in a positive comment in their report on the effects of internal curing. We're not trying to replace conventional curing and we're not advocating not doing conventional curing, but what it does is it provides uh, some room for when things don't go exactly the way they're supposed to go. They're supposed to get 10 days of wet curing on that deck and they didn't get any wet curing and they, in some places they didn't even get any curing compound and we still went a year without a crack. Okay, so a reminder, we're talking about normal weight concrete. When we typically do internal curing of normal weight concrete, the density is only reduced a few pounds per cubic foot. It's still normal weight concrete. You design it according to ACI 318, and you don't have to use any strength modifiers, and you can still use a pressure meter to check air content. We do have some standards. This is a joint report of the 308 Curing Committee and the 213 Lightweight Committee. Another document I always like to point out is this state-of-the-art report, but look at the date on that state-of-the-art report, 2010, but it's still a great document. So my almost final thoughts are it's not new. Proven technology ready to go, it will improve the quality of the concrete. The question I always get is what happens if this really takes off? Will we run out of lightweight aggregate to supply it? Well there are lightweight plants across the country from California to New York. I think New York's the furthest east, south of that. North Carolina. So there are plants scattered around the country. We can cover the contiguous 48 states pretty easy. Logistically, the, the costs are going to be a little more the farther you are from a plant. But remember, you're only putting, you're replacing, in Denver's case, 18% of the sand. Somewhere between 20 and 30% sand replacement, you're putting a few cubic feet, loose cubic feet of sand in there. So it, even, even with logistics costs, you're not going to increase the cost of the concrete that much. Typically in the concrete that you're specifying internal curing in, that's really important concrete. Just using the example of concrete pavements. American Concrete Pavement Association reports 50 million square yards of concrete placement per year in the United States. If we use an average thickness of 8 inches and we use an average replacement of 30 percent, which is probably on the high side, that's a lightweight aggregate demand of one and a half million cubic yards. That's if every square yard of concrete pavement was internally cured. Expanded Shale Clay and Slate Institute reports excess capacity in 2017 of more than two million cubic yards. In other words, we have, our, our lightweight aggregate plants right now are not sold out. Two million yards of excess capacity in the country that could easily take care of lightweight aggregate 